So maybe we should move now to Marina's presentation. And Marina Rostow, who we've already, you've already seen her, you know, yesterday and throughout today, um, is the Khuduri A. Zilcha Professor of Jewish Civilization in the Near East at Princeton University. She's also the director of Princeton's Geniza Lab. And um, she is a culture, see, a social historian um, of the Middle East, medieval Middle East. She works on documents, especially sources from the Cairo Geniza, uh, which is a cache of roughly 400,000 folio pages and fragments preserved in Egyptian synagogue, for those who may not know the Geniza. And uh, she works on a number of questions. Um, what makes social and religious groups cohere and fragment? How do people demand justice of the state and facilitate or resist its extraction of resources? How are written documents structured, the exercise of power and the creation and maintenance of social bonds? And one of the, I think, really interesting points, which I think resonates so well with Peter's is, you know, what can we do in reconstructing the concrete details of medieval life? Um, what does this demand of the historian in terms of the use of the imagination that is uh, both rigorous, um, that is rigorous rather than strictly only fanciful? I'm sure there's some fanciful in it, but also rigorous um, in its evidentiary base. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Marina. I should say she's written um, a number of books, um, most recently, The Lost Archive, Traces of a Caliphate in a Cairo Synagogue, also Heresy and Politics of Community, the Jews of the Fatimid Caliphate. So Marina, your turn. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you, Arzu and Zizi and the whole team and everybody who's here. It's really been incredibly interesting on a huge variety of levels. Um, so I run the Princeton Geniza project. I've been doing it since 2015. And um, I'll tell you what it is. First, I'm gonna give you like a lightning introduction to the Geniza for those who are not up to date. Um, so I, I changed the title of my, of my paper as I was like, you know, kind of tightening the screws over the last couple of days because I realized more than interoperability, I'm actually talking about data sharing. And so I wanna maybe dig into that difference a little bit. Okay, so, but for the introductory stuff, um, how's the view? Did my slide just advance? That's amazing. Okay, so the Princeton Geniza Project has not actually relied on crowdsource information in the 35 years that it's been around, um, but we've dipped a couple of toes into crowdsourcing because we regularly vet uh, aggregated handless descriptions from a different Geniza Project, the Friedberg Geniza Project, which I'll introduce to you. Um, which is kind of high level crowdsourcing because these are scholars who are contributing um, descriptions of, of fragments. Um, but nonetheless, it requires a lot of editorial sifting. And then we also advised a, a proper crowdsourcing project from which we've gotten data that's been um, very challenging to use. So I'm basically presenting to you some of the challenges um, of crowdsourcing and, and utilizing crowdsourcing data with a, um, eye towards the question of like, is this, is it a good or is it a, a sort of energy efficient way of generating information um, about a large unedited or uncatalogued um, corpus? Okay, so very briefly, the Cairo Geniza um, was found in a synagogue in Fustat where the Jewish community had kind of lost track of it. And then gradually it started coming to light over the course of the 19th century. Fustat is the medieval residential core of Cairo and the synagogue in question is the Ben Ezra. It's there, but what's there is actually a simulacrum of the medieval synagogue because it got rebuilt in the late 19th century. Um, so uh, the grand total um, of Geniza fragments um, that, sorry, the dates, um, mainly 950 to 1250, that's kind of like the core of the information that we have, although there are significant pockets from, um, from later periods, especially the 16th century and then later into the Ottoman period, which are only starting to get attention now. Um, there was one person working on this stuff for the longest time, and now there are like, you know, five or six, which is incredible. Um, the languages, there's like a dizzying variety of languages, although the vast majority of what you find are Judeo languages, so written in Hebrew script, especially Aramaic, Hebrew, and Judeo-Arabic. The grand total, 400,000 pages or fragments of pages. Anyone who deals with stuff like this knows that counting is a big problem. Is a bifolio, one page, two pages, four pages? So only, then these numbers can only ever be a kind of ballpark, but it's a lot. Um, of which an estimated 90% are um, what historians call literary texts, meaning basically texts that were intended for long posterity. And I'm putting books in quotation marks because books in the Middle Ages could take many forms. 
Um, this is a fragment of the codex, which is the book as we know it, like you buy a paperback or hardcover, that's a codex. Um, here are some fragments of codices that have actually been reconstructed based on stuff that was hanging around in the Geniza. This is actually a complete choir, so a, a 10 pager, which is a much more typical form of the book in this period. Um, there's another one, and this is a horizontal scroll. Um, in this case, a Torah scroll, but there were other horizontal scrolls. Um, and this is a vertical scroll. So lots of different book formats um, are, uh, are, you know, have come to light. Um, so that leaves the other 10%, which is about 40,000 documentary texts. And that's what I work on. That's what my team works on. And that's what the Princeton Geniza Lab um, works on. We're devoted only to the documentary texts, letters, legal texts, and so forth, the uh, stuff of everyday life. There's a nice marriage contract for you from Jerusalem from the 11th century, which is actually, although there's tons of material from, from Syria, Palestine, um, there uh, are very few marriage contracts from 11th century Jerusalem. So this is like quite, a, quite an interesting specimen. We can see the 10 signatures at the bottom of the page there. Um, this is a trade letter, which is uh, one of the you know, most fun genres to work on. We've all kind of dealt in trade letters and had a good time with it. Um, and they come from an absolutely vast range of places and all somehow made their way back um, to Fustat. So literally like, you know, every place on the highlighted area, this map is represented. Um, like, you know, there were Jews in Sumatra and Malaysia in the 13th century, who knew? Um, so, so that's the kind of basic historical overview. Um, it, the Geniza is today scattered across more than 60 uh, libraries and private collections. Um, and it sorts out like this, um, 120,000 shelf marks, which is about 200,000 fragments. So half the Geniza um, is in the Cambridge University Library, um, which I'll be coming back to in a minute. Um, and then the rest is uh, distributed across lots of different collections, including JTS in New York, which has 43,000 fragments in 32,000 shelf marks. Um, that, by the way, in case you haven't figured this out, is one of the challenges of working on this material is that there are so many different um, institutions to deal with. And, and there's even stuff that's come up on auction um, from private collectors um, over the last three years. So there's, it's really like an immense scattering of material. Um, why is it so scattered? You can find the answer in this wonderful book, which I highly recommend, and also in a forthcoming book, which though I haven't read it yet, I've read some of the articles that led up to it, and it's going to be Fantastic, explosive. Um, okay, so now the Princeton Geniza Project, the database um, that I run. This is just to give you a concrete sense of, um, of what it looks like. Um, if you want to, there are 31,000 entries in the database, which feels like a lot. Um, it's, you know, these things are always relative. Um, if you wanna search the descriptions, because let's say like your Judeo-Arabic, you know, isn't good today. Um, you can uh, search descriptions in English. So you search for flax and you find 142 um, records with uh, flax in it, or you can search for flax in Judeo-Arabic, um, 10, and you get 161 um, records. And then there's this nice little little doodad here, which lets you to do lets you do the same search in the Arabic papyrology database at the touch of a button. Um, and then you get the results in, in among their documents, which are by and large, not the same as our documents. There's a teensy bit of overlap, but not a ton. Um, we have a new uh, back end, which actually it's not really, a, I mean, I shouldn't be using the term back end. We keep calling it the back end around the lab, but I realized over the last couple of days that, I mean, this is the researcher back end. This is not the developer back end. So the terms that I've heard used for this are admin interface, which is accurate, but boring. Um, and then uh, Segolen Albuy this morning just used the term back office, which I love. So this is our back office. Um, and uh, you can see, you know, more or less how our data is structured. Um, that's kind of what we spent like the last four years doing is trying to restructure our data so that we can um, build something that looks like this with lots of you know instantaneous filter functions, which is which is quite nice. Um, so the the new back office forced us to restructure our data and to develop a new data model and to migrate um, everything that we had done over the past thirty five years. I'll get into the history in a moment. Um, and we've mostly done the post-migration cleanup. The migration happened in May, but it's still not perfect. Um, data migration, as we were saying earlier, um, is very costly. 
in terms of time and risk to the cleanliness of your data. But in this case, it was like so worth it that it wasn't even funny. Um, okay, so uh, the grand total document types in the PGP, um, most of what we have um, are letters, which is good fun, uh, lots of legal documents, and then a scattering of other genres. And I can tell you that only because we restructured our data over the last four years, otherwise I couldn't possibly have told you um, those, those statistics. Okay, how did we get here? So the Princeton Geniza Lab was actually based on um, the personal um, quote unquote Geniza lab of S.D. Goitain, who's kind of like the, the granddaddy of the field of documentary Geniza studies. Um, he had a lot of photocopies, literally photocopies, they put them on the copy machine of Geniza fragments. And um, he taught at Penn until 1967. And then he was um, in Princeton until 1985 when he died. Um, and, uh, and he used the term lab because he was influenced by Brodel and the kind of French laboratoire method, whatever, of, you know, collaborative research. Um, so when he died, his students, Mark Cohen and Avram Yudovich, founded the Princeton Geniza Lab um, to kind of continue his work. And so we have a filing cabinet full of Boytine's unpublished transcriptions and um, other materials on, uh, on, on Geniza documents. I mean, he published, you know, like incredibly prolifically, but there was also a lot of unpublished material that we could benefit from. Um, I came aboard the project in 2015 together with my colleague, Eve Krakowski, and, um, and we took things in a slightly different direction. So the Princeton Geniza project has always been um, what the Princeton Geniza lab has done. Um, and so they were kind of like coterminous. And then in 2015, I was like, well, why don't we see if we can branch out? And so we branched out into a few different things. We had a project going called Documents and Institutions in the Medieval Middle East, where we were trying to dig into how you can derive information about legal courts and state bureaucracy um, from diplomat, from good old fashioned diplomatics, like from the, the um, structural kind of formulae that you find in documents. Um, that was fun. And then Scribes of the Caragoniza, which is a crowdsourcing project that I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, and then we have a handwritten text recognition project going as well with Daniel Stuckel and Ezra, who's here. And um, my project manager for that, Jessica Parker, is also here. And a couple of the RAs who work on the project, so our Berman is here, which is great. Um, so these are in some ways like different branches of the Princeton Geniza Lab, but the reality is that everything we do ultimately um, goes back into the database. So this is really still kind of the main event. Um, I wanna give you a little bit of a sense of how the database developed over time, because um, I think my sense is that the PGP is an unusually old database. Um, I mean, we're now working with the, the um, Center for Digital Humanities, the CDH at Princeton, and they're like, ooh, we've never done a 4.0. So like, you know, we're, we've, we've been around the block. Um, so in um, 1985, when I was still in high school, um, the PGP began as um, basically it was like on a computer terminal in Princeton. Um, and then gradually, you know, when the web came along, um, it became publicly usable. I wrote my dissertation in the late nineties using um, the PGP um, pretty much constantly. Um, and at the time it contained uh, over 4,000 transcriptions of Geniza fragments. Um, 3,700 descriptions, note the discrepancy. So there were transcriptions with no English language descriptions whatsoever. So this was a real specialist resource. The main functionality of the database was searching transcriptions. That was, that's what it was there for. So you needed um, to know Judeo languages in order to use it. I have no idea how many limita because we haven't limitized yet, but someday we will. Um, so yeah, so that was the main functionality was searching transcriptions and it was really like kind of a hardcore specialist um, resource. Um, the sources of the transcription were kind of interesting because um, we, we were already kind of gathering from far and wide. There were peer reviewed publications, stuff scattered all over journals. Um, there was Goitain's Nachlas, um, which I'll get back to. And then there were the in-house transcriptions um, that were being done by grad students and faculty affiliated um, with the project. Um, but transcriptions take a really long time, even though these documents tend to be only one page long, because it's that last 20% that you can't quite read that just takes forever and then you don't want to put it online because what if it's bad and, you know, all that philological hand wringing applies. Um, we're trying to be a little looser about it now and say like these are just in progress. Um, 
So this is this is part of the Guaytan Nachlas. This is one of his index cards. He left 26,000 index cards when he died, okay? So, which we've digitized. It took us a couple of years to digitize these, but um, they're there and, and, and linked in various ways that make them actually discoverable. Um, the 3.0 began in 2015, and we took a little bit of a, um, of a different, uh, a different path, Eve Krakowski and I, because both of us decided, okay, transcriptions are great, but they take forever. Um, and we really wanna know how many documents are in the Geniza. So let's just spread our nets and see what's out there. And that's what we did. And so that brought us up to 19,000 um, descriptions, like actual descriptions, um, as opposed to just entries that are like stubs, because we have a lot of those as well. And so the new sources of data that we added were the Cambridge University Digital Library um, and the Friedberg Geniza project. So Cambridge University Digital Library, Cuddle, as it's known to, <laughs> to insiders, um, is, uh, is the result of the fact that um, Cambridge has a whole Geniza research unit in the library. And they've had this since the 70s. And they have amazing people coming and um, working there, having postdocs. I mean, all of this is like, you know, PhD and postdoc level um, research. So that means that when I asked them for their document descriptions, just documentary texts, and they sent me a spreadsheet of 10,000 descriptions, I knew that I could just post them immediately. Like I completely trusted the data, even though they use a different transliteration system from us, I was like, that's okay, it's Cambridge. And, um, and it's been an amazing resource for, for lots and lots of people. The other big um, resource is the Friedberg Geniza project. And you know, we're all in, in, eternally in their debt because they're the ones who you know, got on the airplanes, <laughs> specifically Jakob Schweika um, of blessed memory who directed the project for many years, um, got these 60 plus institutions to actually digitize their material or, or he did it for them. Um, and as a result, you have uh, millions of photos of Geniza fragments in this, um, in this database. Um, the thing is, they had quite a bit cataloged as documents, um, but we couldn't really trust the data because it was crowdsourced, even though it was crowdsourced from like, you know, like nerds like us, um, it wasn't always accurate. And that's because most of the people who work in the Geniza field work on literary fragments. So you had a lot of like literature specialists um, cataloging documents in ways that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have done. Um, so, when I got the data from them, we really had to kind of comb through it very, very carefully. Um, this is what it looked like. I'm not actually showing you any descriptions. They were all in Hebrew and they were like kind of messy and we're basically still working at um, checking it to make sure that the texts that they say are documentary are really documentary. And so far we've weeded out about 5,000 that they sent us that aren't real, real documents. Um, so I just wanna emphasize um, for this part of the talk that how do we get this data? by emailing spreadsheets back and forth. Like it was that it was that primitive. We had to massage and restructure the data that we got. So this was not interoperability, this was data sharing, human relations, drinking tea in the bazaar. I went to Cambridge and volunteered my labor for a couple of weeks, like in the hopes that they would like give me their data, which they did, um, that kind of thing. Just keeping up relationships, asking after family as any medieval trader will tell you, um, that's how you build relationships of trust. Um, so when you're using the, the database, you can tell where the data came from. This is from a published source, um, which also comes with a little bonus, which is an index card of Goytines about this particular document, Goytines typed uh, transcription, which is kind of a nice thing. And then Goytan actually published a translation of it. It's not all Goytan, but most of the, the kind of Nahasi stuff that we have is Goytan. Um, Alternatively, if you um, get an in-house description that we wrote ourselves, there are usually initials on it. This is Alan Elbaum, who um, is an amazing medical student who has cataloged like I think more Geniza fragments than any living human, um, just out of love for the Geniza and also need to make extra money on the side, which I happen to be able to pay him. Um, or if the information comes from Cuddle, um, then you get a link to, um, to Cuddle itself and you can see um, the document in, in context of their database. Um, we have 3,794 records that come straight from Cuddle. We only have 84 records now that are marked as information from FGP. Um, that's to give you a sense of sort of, you know, how carefully we've had to sift through the FGP descriptions. Um, Sarah, how am I on time? Well, 
You're fine, I think. Uh, we started a little early, to be fair. So, yeah. Okay. All right. I, I don't okay. think so you're going I, on forever. I, I, you're going to have, what, a few more slides? That's right. Yeah. I, that's good. As long as I'm not like, you know, a million minutes over because I've no sense. Okay. Um, so, consequences of the fact that we're a 35 year old database. Um, we have very rich data. We also have very dirty data. Um, we've had to do extensive cleaning and restructuring over the last six years. How did that happen? Initially, I'm not kidding you, it was me and a Google Sheet late at night. That was like the first two years. Then I was like, you know, I might need some help with this. Um, so <laughs> gradually the team expanded, which was wonderful. I, I had some resources at the lab to be able to do that. I love working collaboratively. So it also just made my life, you know, more fun. Um, and, uh, and then we entered into a partnership with the Center for Digital Humanities, um, who built us our back office and are also going to be building us this year um, a front end um, that may or may not look something like this. So it's gonna integrate um, image and text. We're actually hoping that it'll integrate them a little bit more closely than this. So not side by side, but line by line. So inshallah later this year, um, we'll debut that. Um, but by far the most important thing that we do is to curate data. And I just wanna say one other thing about the CDH partnership, they completely restructured the way we work. So in the last two years, thanks to the partnership with them, um, we have a Slack channel, which makes us feel very official. Um, I have project managers, um, Jessica Barker is here and Rachel Richman, um, who directs on the PGP side. I would not be able to do the work without them. Um, and I meet with them you know, weekly at minimum. Um, we have workflows, we have a decision log. Um, we basically institutionalize the whole operation and we have a separate department um, just for, so this is the PGP team. And then this is for the handwritten text recognition project, um, a, a totally separate team for that. Um, what we, so, so I think the, the so the, sorry, so the goal of the HTR project is gonna be to produce 15,000 additional transcriptions, depending on how many like IIIF images we can easily get access to. Um, at which point we'll have a different problem, which is how to mine all those transcriptions at scale, but that's a far off bridge that we'll cross when we come to it. Um, and will require like yet more cleaning. Um, okay, so the last piece of this um, is the Zooniverse. And this is, this is crowdsourcing properly so-called. So the Zooniverse is an absolutely fantastic project um, to get actual scientific projects posted online that could use crowdsourced um, data. So for example, look at a bunch of photos, identify pollinators in Ireland, um, or look at a bunch of like, you know, photos of a galaxy and identify you know, baby galaxies or something like that. Um, so they were interested, the Zooniverse, in having transcription projects. Um, and they were interested in transcription as a problem, like crowdsourcing and transcription, how does that work? So they were looking very much for back-end data, but we being us and some people at Penn and some people at Haifa thought, wouldn't it be great if we could get like actual, like, in, like transcribed documents out of this? That was a bit ambitious. And in fact, we haven't really gotten transcriptions um, out of the Zooniverse project, but we have, um, I mean, it was, it, was a, it was an interesting experiment nonetheless. So our Zooniverse project is called Scribes of the Kairaganiza. If you're like a crossword puzzle doer or a Sudoku um, player, like now you have, you know, another thing to do in your leisure time. Um, there are two workflows. One is for sorting documents. So you look at it and, um, and answer, you know, kind of 20 questions about it. It's not really 20, it's more like five. So this is in Hebrew script. It's kind of formally written. You have like justified margins and the writing looks pretty even. Even if you don't look, he even if you don't read Hebrew, you can kind of look at it and, and say these things. There's evidence of binding. Um, the margins are justified. There's top corner where on the page. So all this indicates that this once belonged to a codex if it does not in fact still belong to a codex. And then the telltale sign use of a colon in the text. That means we really have to look at the scribal practice here because those kinds of scribes tended to copy um, books. The field guides are wonderful. And I have to say the field guide, this was one of the best things about the Zooniverse for me, um, which is that the field guide forced me to sit down and create some pedagogical tools that I never would have done otherwise. I had to organize information to present it to the public and the non-Hebrew reading public um, in a way that made sense of it. And that was um, a fantastic intellectual exercise, which um, you know was, was worth it. 
just for that. Um, the second workflow is the actual transcription workflow. Um, and the transcription workflow is kind of fun because the premise is you don't need to know the script to actually do the transcription. True, false, I don't know, you, you be the judge, but um, the, what we've done is to create different keyboards based on the kinds of handwriting that you're likely to find in Geniza documents. So if you wanna switch to Maghrib Square, you can you know, do that and then suddenly you get a keyboard that is made up of Maghrib Square script, which is like totally great. This, this was... Um, this was an amazing thing that they helped us to do. Um, and there's also an Arabic transcription workflow that you can have a good time with. Um, if you find an interesting fragment, then you, you post about it on the talk boards and the talk boards are great fun. So I get an email every time somebody tags me in a talk board or tags researchers in a talk board and I can answer like some questions. Um, and it's amazing to see how many people have um, contributed to this. I mean, literally thousands, and some of them are really into it and, and do it kind of repeatedly. At the same time, you can't really just launch a crowdsourcing project and throw it out into the world and, and, and expect that people will come to you. Um, so uh, we um, followed our colleagues at Haifa in having a transcribe-a-thon or two, which was lots of fun. Um, at Haifa, they do it even better because they bring, they bring the Zooniverse into schools. Um, so you have school children in, um, in Israel slash Palestine, because they're doing both Hebrew and Arabic workflows, um, transcribing Geniza documents. And that's kind of like, you know, that's the gold standard for me. That's what I'd, what I'd love to see happen. Some of the data that we get back from the Zooniverse, however, is very perplexing to me. So we have not yet really been able to do a whole lot with the data, but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, all is not lost on that front. To conclude, um, so I was thinking that crowdsourcing is kind of on a spectrum um, with data sharing and then full interoperability. So at the level of data creation, crowdsourced data is minimally curated. Um, data sharing, if you're like, you know, if I'm going and writing to Cambridge and saying, hey, can I have some descriptions? That's, that's good curation. Like you're gonna um, get your data from places that, from sources that you trust. Um, full interoperability, same deal. Like if you're going to be interoperable with a database, you need to trust their resources. In terms of the actual data reuse by the PGP, crowdsourced data requires intensive curation. So it's very, very time intensive. Um, data sharing requires a kind of variable letter, letter, level of curation, depending on um, how close you are to the questions that those research researchers are asking. Whereas full interoperability is of course minimal curation because you're just seeing it in the context of somebody else's, um, somebody else's database. That's what I've got. That's great, Marina. Thank you so much. Uh, 